Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Nearly. Oh, it is afternoon, yes. I'm still on English time. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come here and tell you a little bit about this. And obviously, a non-manufacturing cat is a little bit of a, an unusual thing, so I'm going to spend a few moments talking about that, if I may, uh, to give you some sort of context. Um, the thing about it is electronics is so much a part of what we're doing now and so much a part of our economic developments it's hard to imagine just what the world would be like without it but everything in the new economy in the development of the economy is going to be increasingly dependent on it I want to say this is IT and ICT as an enabling tool what I'm talking about is a business which is making those tools so this is, this is a different context, I think, because IT and ICT enables business, and we use it ourselves, but at the same time we're in business to develop those tools and make them available to you, to you and also to ourselves. So we, we're somewhat introverted. So Moore's Law, which you've probably heard of, is a, a key part of this because this has given us two times the number of transistors and you don't know what they are yet in an integrated circuit every 18 months for the last something like 50 years and this means that today we're dealing with around a billion or so transistors on an integrated circuit and they don't just get put on the integrated circuit somebody has to design them somebody has to position them and to show how they're all connected it's quite an intricate process um, these transistors are very small. 15 nanometers is the state of the art today, 14 nanometers. Um, it's a very small number. It's difficult to put it into any kind of context, but I put it in the context of a banknote. You could put 6,000 of these side by side in the thickness of a banknote. And because of Moore's law, we'll be able to put 12,000 side by side next year and 24,000 the year after that. This is the scale of the design challenge that we're facing here. Uh, today, for example, ARM is 25 years old, pretty well. And uh, the integrated circuits that, that people are using now, that people are designing now, are 200,000 times more capacity than when ARM was founded. We're not the same company. You can't design integrated circuits in the same way. You can't design the systems that they go into in the same way. And so these are very large challenges which are being faced. And the result of facing those challenges is we're breaking down the process of designing these immensely complicated systems into small modules that can be handled and can be viable businesses, incidentally, on their own within them. So we call it business within the life cycle of electronic systems. Now, ARM is a knowledge company then, so the product that we sell is to help people to design these complex systems. And just to put it into context, these are always the most complex machines that have ever been made by man. We're still not approaching the levels of complexity of biology, but year upon year we get ever more complex. So this is a continuous and endless challenge. Now, just to briefly uh, emphasize something that Roger mentioned earlier, um, how public perceives what we do, because surely the idea is the public must value what we do because they value the electronic systems that they're carrying around with them. Not a bit of it, it seems. The public's perception of engineering uh, is really rather, really rather poor. But this, su this survey, which was, con uh, which was conducted back in 2011 in the UK, they asked people about uh, whether engineers would be instrumental in the solution to climate change. And there was a fairly positive indication, 92% of men, 84% of women thought that they would. The bad part came with the second part of the question, because they asked them how many things that they knew of in the last 50 years that had been produced by engineering uh, could they think of. And 50-ish percent of people couldn't think of any. Now that's a really rather worrying thing, and let's just say this is a few years further down the road, so hopefully it's improved a little bit. Um, but they've made, the scientists and engineers have made the world we live in, and yet most people don't see that at all. It's perfectly human. Uh, so, ARM then, when we say ARM is in things, and you probably are not aware of the things that ARM is in, but you're, you have, typically, ten ARMs that you own. <laughs> And you're not aware of them. They're the intel inside everything else. Okay? So everything which doesn't have, which is relatively smart and doesn't have an intel inside sticker on the outside of it is actually probably ARM powered. 
So we're talking about 95% of the smartphones and tablets, 70% of the smart TVs, 90% of the games consoles, 80% of digital cameras, and an awful lot of other stuff in the environment that you just don't see. The Internet of Things, watches, headphones, bicycles, computers, uh, the infrastructure all the way through these days to the servers are increasingly arm powered. That means that our technology is being used in them but the products don't carry an arm badge. So looking perhaps at the thing which most people would associate with arm, a smartphone, we don't make the phone, and we don't make the chips which are inside them, and it's interesting to note that there are about 20 chips inside a smartphone, so anybody gets the idea that there's just one chip in there? It's not the truth at all. We don't make the chips. Ah knowledge goes into the processors which is the main processor in there but it also goes into pretty well all of the other ones as well and so inside your average smartphone there are probably 10 processors and we are contributing to the design of each one of those contributing we're part of the life cycle of the design of these complex chips the chips come together to make these complex systems and the complex systems are what you ultimately buy in the high street shops so we're somewhere down inside there but we're a vital part of it because the main thing that we do is we enable people to be highly productive we enable them to reuse what they did before we enable them to bring very much larger teams and sometimes of lower skilled people uh, to play in the design of these complex systems. It would take literally hundreds of thousands of man years to design these systems from a clean sheet of paper every time. You can't. The design teams are only a few hundred people big. But a few hundred people is still a fairly large team to bring together. Now not surprisingly then arm partners with a thousand plus partners all around the world. We are truly an international company. <laughs> And we shipped, through those partners, 12 billion CPUs last year. But we don't have a manufacturing facility. We don't make anything, but we ship 12 billion. And in fact, there have been 60 billion shipped since the beginning of ARM. A number which is growing surprisingly quickly, because uh, we, it took us until 2008 to ship our first 1 billion in a year. So we've grown from 1 billion to 12 billion in a year between 2008 and today. So our business model then must be a little bit novel, and yes it is. Um, we have, if you look down the, the vertical column to the right, we have two or three years of, in, of investment in the design of these virtual products that we produce. And they cost us a lot of money, a lot of design effort, and it's done throughout our design centers all around the world. Um, and that two or three year period, we're probably talking tens of millions of euros at that stage to get to that point. By that time, we can start to sell it to people who are going to use it in their generation of products. We can get some license revenue from that, but it's another two or three years before they're going to have got their product into the market. Don't let anybody tell you that it only takes a couple of years to get these products into the market. The six years there before the product has moved from the drawing board to, a mark, to something which is going to appear on the shelves in the, in the high street. And then these products, surprisingly, have a lifetime of up to 20 years. Even today, these products have a lifetime of up to 20 years. They put them in different colored boxes and they reshape the packages a little bit, but essentially they don't change. And then we get re uh, royalty revenue on that basis. Um, <clears throat> ARM technology has been seen to create new global markets and to transform existing ones. I mean, essentially, the, the smartness that you're used to seeing in everything today wouldn't be there if you didn't have the processor in there, wouldn't be there if you didn't have the productivity that we offer. Now, I'm not to say that something else wouldn't have come up to take its place, but right now it's today and it's ARM. So we're a 1.3 billion revenue company, where 28% of that revenue we spend on R&D. Yet we're only a small company, just 3,300 people worldwide, 1,400 in the UK. Yet we're about number 40 in the UK for the size of company. Biggest company, value is £1.2 trillion in market capital. So it doesn't need to be a biggest company to be the most significantly valued. Um, what have we got there? 350 
potential royalty payers. Now, this is good news to us because these are people who are in the early stages. They've licensed the product, they're buying it, they're making the product, but the products haven't hit the shelves yet. And we've got 350 new companies in there who are designing stuff which, you, which is going to be ARM based. That's our future revenue. So let's look at what ARM then represents because uh, to some respects we are a typical knowledge based business. Now, we're typical and atypical. 95% of ARM's employees have bachelor's degrees. That's not uh, that high a qualification, but it only says that 5% of them are below that level. 50% have masters and 9% have doctorates. Um, of the new hires, roughly we get a third through acquisition, acquisitions of businesses, a third by uh, employment of experienced people, and a third by new graduates. And roughly 40% are based on computer science, 40 electrical and electronic, and 20% physics, maths, and other. And it's interesting to look at the other because if you look at the ARM board, and the way we're structured is we have a board and we also have an executive, and I've brought them slightly different here, uh, but just to show that um, we are a heavily engineering company because most of the board, both of them, are engineers. Um, we have a slight uh, di uh, discrepancy when it comes to our CFO, who started off with history as his degree. Um, mo moving it to the executive, we have our company secretary, who's a lawyer, our general counsellor, who is a, who's a chemist turned lawyer. So there's a fair degree of flexibility there in their lifetimes. Uh, and our HR director was actually a material scientist who turned HR somewhere along the line. Um, we all. I think what we can see from there is that all businesses, and the, these businesses are no exception, need a diversity of skills. Uh, the technology businesses just need a predominance of the technology skills, um, but then there is still business, there are still requirement for other skills throughout that area. <clears throat> and the other point is, of course, that careers are dynamic things. Uh, and they, involve, they evolve during the profession, professional lifetime of those people involved in doing so. So, does ARM have a recruitment problem? Well, the answer is no. Um, could we have one? Well, we certainly could. Uh, we don't have a recruitment problem primarily because we're a global operator and we have a good image, which means that people have heard of us and they want to work with us. Um, now, the other thing that we do is we have 34 offices all around the world, uh, seven of which are major design facilities. And so we can, in we can pick up the best wherever they are and we can include them either into a local office or into an office where they want to be. We also offer career development, of course, which allows those people to move around between the offices if that's what they want to do as well. Um, we have around 300 vacancies at any given time. We have, a, we have that today. Uh, 224 of which are engineer level and 144 are in Europe. We are a European headquartered company. We want to grow in Europe, but we're not going to be held back by the availability of the appropriately skilled people in Europe. Um, as a company, we're growing um, in numbers about 20% per, uh, per annum, but a business is growing about 20% per annum. So that is also a continuous drive on the in increased efficiency, of course. So we're recruiting fast enough to meet our plans for organic growth. And uh, so those excellent individuals join us primarily in Europe and the US when they are non-nationals uh, of, uh, of the countries which are, uh, where, where our design offices are. Um, and the acquisitions, of course, have the attra added attraction of these are more efficient acquisitions than individuals because, as Christina pointed out earlier, these, these groups are working together. They are already delivering more than the sum of the individual parts. Uh, and, of course, retention is an important part for us. By, develop, by developing these people, we are also developing our future, but we're also helping to maintain them. They want to stay with us because they see that we are concerned about their career path. <clears throat> but at the same time, we don't need to be a 30,000 head company because, as I might have mentioned, we don't have a factory, and neither do we need one. Surprisingly, there are many companies like ARM, it's just that ARM is, not, is a fairly big example of them. Um, these are essentially businesses which are distributed all around the place, sometimes in ones and twos and tens. The, there was a report done in the UK by uh, ESCO, you can find it online, there's a reference there, 
Um, and it identified 850,000 people occupied in this space in the UK doing things associated with the provision of ICT technologies in the life cycles of those ICT technologies. Not the support of IT, not the support of ICT, but the provision of the technology and the development of things which are valuably deployed in the life cycle of electronic systems. So then, it's a journey of a lifetime to be an engineer in this space, and I admit I'm an engineer. Um, the tertiary education system gets you onto the first rung of the ladder. That's all. It allows you to understand the language of your peers. And the main thing you've got to learn from that point onward is that it's you who are going to develop yourself. You have to move forward. You have to uh, be able to take your skill and to make it work in a part of a team. And to, to develop yourself so you stay valuable. Certificates matter. Clearly, when you're employing those people in the first instance, you don't know anything else about them. But as soon as they start to get experience of anything, then that experience becomes fairly dominant. And in a technology area which is developing as quickly as this is, then it's the last three to five years of experience which really tells the world who you are. So the majority then of an engineer scientist training is through life. Uh, the capabilities a business has is limited by the capabilities of its employees. You think about that. Its employees determine what a business can do. It's very, very important then that the business recruits people to complement where it wants to go. And a, a final fo uh, footnote on that one is that nobody can manufacture engineers and scientists. The outcome from any educational establishment is an embryo engineer or scientist. It's not an engineer or scientist. It takes time and it takes experience and it's where grey hair comes from. Witness my own. <laughs> now, it's not a, uh, a popular thing, but just to look at some numbers. Yeah. Very quickly, um, look at some numbers. Um, around, this is a, a study I did in, for myself, for my own interests. Around 3% of the population in the UK has an engineering degree. Only half of this number are actually employed in engineering and scientific roles. That's equivalent to about one person in a secondary education class. This one person is commonly known as a geek, right? This is the odd person who's sitting in the corner. It's always difficult being a geek, and it's worse if you're a female geek, okay? So, but that, that helps to explain. These are just 1% of them will make world-class leaders. That's tiny. It's 0.03% of the population, and yet these people are people that you can do huge amounts with to improve your economy. Just multiply them by two or three means a, a, a address the attention, encourage the development of 0.1% of the population and you will have an economy, a digital economy, which is three times the size that it is today. So conclusions then. Um, we require a two-pronged approach to education. We need to educate society, as other people have said. They have got to realise the value of the economic contribution that we're making. In the UK, ESCO said 3% of the population is contributing 6% of the UK economy. Think of that. We're twice as productive as the average uh, economic rep uh, contributor. Um, we must tell that. Business must value it, the economy and the career opportunities that go along with it and educate the individuals. They have got to be real, they've got to realize that it's not just strive to get this degree and then you'll be an engineer scientist. It's a through life thing. It's actually a pleasure. It's a huge fun. It's a challenging role and it's better than the best computer games that you can buy. <clears throat> but it does require governments to encourage and support intellectual elitism. Um, intellectual elitism, I can imagine, is not very popular. But if you're a rower, a sportsman, then it's okay if you've got big muscles. It's just different kind of muscles that we're talking about here. It's biological, and they need to be built up and developed just the same way. Um, okay, and now my final slide, really. How can such a small company be a uh, world leader in the way that we are? And the answer is, this is what the 21st century marketing, and this is what the 21st century globalization, and this is what 21st century business is all about. 19th century businesses, 
are dinosaurs. Thank you.